Including all elephant jokes. Including all elephant jokes. So that will be the very first thing that people will hear as they listen to this recording is a mention of elephant jokes, <laughs> which is a great way to start off this webinar on journals and the culture of the peer review process. Welcome to everyone who's joining us in person and thank you to those of you who are listening in on this recording. My name is Jennifer Shirk. I am the Interim Executive Director for the Citizen Science Association and I'm pleased to introduce this third in our webinar series which we are really pleased to offer to the community and we're still learning um, what will work best in serving the interests of this diverse group that we're reaching through the Citizen Science Association. I'll get to our topic at hand in a moment, but I did want to start off by just doing a little bit of an introduction of the webinar series itself and the Citizen Science Association. We are um, uh, still a fairly new and growing not-for-profit organization that is member-based and member-driven. Um, with the idea that we can improve citizen science for everyone who takes part by trying to help those who are running and managing citizen science do this difficult job with access to better information and to each other as resources across this community. Some of the goals that we have stated for the Citizen Science Association are to provide access to tools and to resources that further best practices and to support communication and professional development services. And these are two of the goals that we believe this webinar series as it grows and expands will start to fit into. And we look forward to hearing feedback from everyone across this community as to how we can use and grow this series of webinars to serve those goals. Um, as some of you may know that we are in the third webinar right now of our webinar series. The first was on tools for volunteer recruitment and engagement back in November. The second was on the SciStarter platform and how to leverage those tools, um, whether you're a participant, a project leader, or a researcher. And the fourth in our webinar series is coming up in February, on February 14th. And that will be focused on how to plan a Citizen Science Day event. Citizen Science Day this year will be on Saturday, April 14th, and events will be happening all throughout April, whether or not uh, uh, you're able to do something on the exact day itself. So for an April 14th event, we are holding a February 14th webinar. And if you are interested in doing anything related to Citizen Science Day, uh, please look for forthcoming information to join us for that event. You can follow along on the blog on citizenscience.org and announcements will pop up on that homepage there. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Some of you who were on at the very top of this call as we were getting started know that we're going to be uh, communicating um, via the chat window. I think right now you don't see this exact uh, view because you're looking at my shared screen, but in general you will look for a doc in your um, in, on your desktop that will have an icon with the three little dots for more. If you click on that, you can choose the chat window, which will pop up, and then you can type in an introduction to yourself or any questions or concerns you have as we go along. And I will be monitoring the chat window throughout the webinar, and Rick is willing to entertain questions as we go so we can keep this as a lively conversation about the topic at hand. So please feel free to uh, join in the chat and share your questions um, and make this a conversation as much as it is a presentation. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and uh, kick off the topic at hand. And 
say thank you in advance to Rick Bonney for offering this webinar on journals and the culture of the peer review process. I've had the pleasure of working very closely with Rick for the past ooh, 15 years or so now um, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I know that he is, in addition to being um, a, a leading thinker in citizen science, also a really excellent um, writer and editor. And a few months back, he gave a presentation for staff at the Lab of Ornithology on just generally how the peer review process works, which for those of us, even those of us in academia, um, it can be a bit of a black box and hard to know what's happening between the time a manuscript is written and the time it shows up in quote unquote print, whether that's actually on paper or online these days. And I've asked him to share a bit of that with this community today in this webinar, just opening up what it looks like to get published um, from whatever perspective you are looking at it. And to illustrate that to a certain degree from the perspective of our own journal for which he serves as the editor in chief, um, that's the Citizen Science Association Journal, Citizen Science Theory and Practice. And um, without further ado, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and give Rick a chance to pull his up as I uh, say thank you again to him for being willing to entertain this topic for us today. And I'll just remind everyone as he's doing that, uh, that you can feel free at any time to uh, join in the chat, to share questions or thoughts, um, and we'll keep this as a discussion as we're moving forward. So again, look for the three little dots uh, and the more icon, um, you should be able to open the chat window. Oh, I actually see now that Rick is sharing his screen, I have a separate icon that just says chat, which I will open. Um, and if you open that chat window, you can feel free to join the discussion there. Um, so Rick, thank you again and over to you. Okay, can you see my first slide that says journals, etc. Yes. And can you hear me? Loud and clear and okay. panelists are concurring. All right. Well, it's all downhill from there. That's the hardest part of the webinar. All right. Well, I'm going to start out here um, talking about journals with a few illustrations from one of my very favorite journals which is called bioscience. Um, I like bioscience for a lot of reasons. One is that it's a really high quality journal. If you know anything about impact factors, you can see right here on the front that its impact factor is somewhere between five and six. And I'll explain what that means later if you don't know already. Um, that's actually very high for a science journal. Um, in addition to that, bioscience is the journal in which we published our very first citizen science article in 2009 that sort of set the stage for a lot of the work that's come since that time. Um, very highly cited article. Um, in addition, I'm on the editorial board of bioscience and I find it a very friendly uh, group of people to work with. So if you were to uh, go online and look for bioscience, you'd find this homepage. If you were to dive in just a little bit deeper, you'd see, okay, well, I can see what the current issue is. I can see what some of the articles are that are in there. You can click on an article and see it. And if you are an academic institution or you're a member of uh, the association that produces bioscience, you can actually click on and read the article. Um, Recently, the issue before this one, there was a fantastic article about whale sharks um, and how citizen science can be used to track them through the world's oceans. You can see from the top here that this was actually an editor's choice for the month, which means the editor really liked it, and also that it's one that anybody can access, whether they're at a library or a member of AIBS. This is a really cool article, and it explained how whale sharks can be tracked by participants in citizen science because they have these unique patterns on them. 
So here's the question. How did this article get published? How did it get there? What were all the steps that took a lot of different people to make that happen? And it really starts with the author, right? The author has to want to do this. If any of you have tried to write anything, particularly for a journal, you know there's always better things to do. You could straighten all the books on your bookshelf, or you can look up and see if there's any new elephant jokes on the elephant joke webpage. It's just so hard to focus and get an article written and then show it to your peers and they look at it and they tell you everything that's wrong. It can go on and on and on. But finally, you have something that you think is worthwhile for the world to read and discuss and cite and you submit it. And what happens? It's that black box that Jennifer was talking about. Well, um, I'm going to be illustrating right now with the Bioscience Journal, but most of what I'm talking about is pretty much the same throughout the field of academic journals. And it's all going to start with the editor in chief, in this case, Scott Collins at the University of New Mexico. Scott's going to get the article after you submit it and he's going to think, okay, is this oh, generally appropriate for the bioscience uh, readership, for the bioscience audience? And it may be spam. It may be something about UFOs, and we've gotten a couple of those at Citizen Science Theory and Practice. So in that case, the editor would write a very nice note explaining that, it, thank you for the article, but it really wasn't in keeping with, with, the, with the journal audience. But if Scott decided, yeah, I think this really has some merit, he would then pass it on to a member of the editorial board all journals have editorial boards. They have different names, but a lot of times the folks who are on them are called handling editors. And it's the handling editors that actually really keep the journal alive and functioning and going. Of course, the reviewers too, but I'm, I'll get to them. But these handling editors have a lot of responsibility and they do it for love and, th and for nothing more. You don't get paid to be a handling editor. Nobody knows that you're a handling editor. Most of the time, the authors don't know. If you look at the, the, the website, if you look at the, uh, the list of board members, it's always so small, nobody can read the names anyway. But it's, these are really critical folks who then take a look at the article and they say, okay, well, I know more about this topic than Scott does, so now I'm gonna put my filter over it. And you know what, um, shoo, this, this is interesting, but the citations are out of date. And they, they've really got some, some data in here that are, just don't look right or their conclusions are, you know what, I, I, I just really don't want to send this to reviewers because I just don't think it's the best interest of the reviewer's time to look at this. So at that point, the, the handling uh, editor will send it back to the editor in chief and say, you know what, this, this just isn't gonna make it and here are the reasons why. And at that point, the editor in chief, depending on the journal, will write, as nice a note as possible, sometimes giving some very specific advice about what you would need to do to get the article to be suitable for review, right? But let's say this looks, this looks pretty good. This has a shot um, at being something that we would want to publish. So then it's up to the handling editor to find reviewers. This is the hardest part of the process. There are more and more and more journals out there now. And there isn't really any of a larger pool of reviewers and reviewing is also kind of a thankless job. Most people review because they want to give something back to their field, whatever their field is. Um, and you can sometimes as a handling editor assign this thing or, or request reviews from five, 10, 12, 15 people before you finally get somebody who will agree to review it. Um, the way that editors find uh, reviewers is it may be that they have peers whom they know and trust and they think this would be a good one for this person to review or the journal may have a list of, of potential reviewers that you can use keywords to search through and look for relevant people or um, you might look through the literature cited of the article and say well here's three or four people that are cited a lot they really stand out I, I think we should try to get get these folks to be reviewers um, and sometimes some journals, bioscience included, allow you to suggest reviewers when you submit your article. Now, as a handling editor, I can tell you that only once in a large number of articles have I ever had a suggested reviewer actually agree to review. 
Um, but I always do try to ask um, at least one for each article, um, thinking that that person would be close to the work and would understand it well. So different journals have different um, criteria for how many reviews they try to get. Uh, bioscience tries really hard to stick with three. Three is a nice number of reviews because there can never be a tie. And a lot of times when the reviews come back, they will be pretty, uh, pretty across the board. So that is the next step is that you send out your request for reviewers, reviewers agree to review. Sometimes they don't ever get around to it. You have to keep chasing them. Finally, you get the reviews. It can take two, three months. The authors are wondering what's going on and what's going on is they're waiting for these volunteers out of the goodness of their heart to review their papers. But finally, the handling editor gets back um, a, um, that's right, I was gonna put this picture up while I was talking at you so you didn't have to look at all of those names. This just happens to be my favorite picture that my wife took last summer when we were in Alaska. So it's a little bit more pleasant to look at while I talk at you. So the reviews come back and then the handling editor needs to take a look at them and say, okay, is there agreement? Is there disagreement? Um, the handling editor will need to be familiar with the paper, will have needed to read it pretty carefully. If you have one person that says, this is almost ready to accept, just needs a few minor pieces of work, and another one says, this should be rejected, you gotta figure out what is going on. Why do we have these different viewpoints? And then what the handling editor does is write a recommendation back to the editor-in-chief and say, okay, most of these reviews thought this was a really good paper, but there's some pretty important things they need to do first, and here's what they are. And then the editor-in-chief will use that as a model or a template to write back to the author and say, um, this has gone through the peer review process. It has a lot of merit, but we think it needs these things uh, to be done before it's gonna be ready for publication. Um, please get it back to us in X number of months. Please um, write a response to the reviewers explaining how you've dealt with each one of their comments. Um, and um, we'll take it from there. When we send it back, it may need to go for re-review. It may not, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. Rick. Can I interject a question here real quick mm -hmm. uh, as you're talking about this process? Julie is asking, um, are handling editors the same as associate editors since you're talking about who does what in this process? Right. So different journals all have different uh, names for um, yeah, different names for folks. Usually an associate editor, it's really going to depend. Like at Bioscience, the associate editor is actually somebody who's paid to be on staff and wouldn't be doing um, any of the handling of the papers. Would probably be involved with getting them copy edited later. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about citizen science theory and practice in a few minutes, but for our journal, there's a team of associate editors who are people that I rely on to help me think about new categories of papers, ideas for theme issues, things like that. But they, not all of them handle papers. They're really there to just help me think. Some of them do. Um, so you really can't, there really isn't one set name for all of these folks. I hope that answers the question. Um, so then the editor will get back the, the, uh, the recommendation from the, hand, the handling editor and send it back to the author and then wait. And sometimes the authors give up. Sometimes they're excited and there's not that much work and they send it back. Um, different journals have different, um, different recommendations that can be made like accept and seeing a, an article get accepted the first time, I've never seen it happen on any journal ever. Um, I've seen articles get uh, votes for acceptance after a, a review has been, has been made. There could be major revisions, minor revisions, there can be uh, revise and resubmit, which means you're gonna have to have almost a completely new paper here, but we'll take a look at it when you resubmit it. Um, and so then after that process of getting the paper back, the handling editor looks at it again, and depending on what kind of re revisions were needed, may say, this is, this is fine. They've done a great job. They answered all of the reviewers' comments. I think it's ready to be accepted. They may send it out to some reviewers and say, would you take one more look at this? You had some pretty critical comments. 
Um, sometimes they might send it to a completely new reviewer, but that's rare. Um, and then, you know, make another, another revision. Um, I can tell you that in the case of that article in Bioscience about the whale sharks, um, that it was probably about a year from the time it was first uh, received uh, in the inbox until the time that it was published. Um, and there were lots of, I don't, I don't really want to talk a lot about somebody's specific article, article, but there's lots of back and forth and round and round. That's just how it goes because it's everybody's goal to make the articles as good as they can. So at that point, once it's accepted, it goes to copy editing. A journal like Bioscience, which has a staff, a professional paid staff, would have copy editors that would be paid to do the copy editing. At that point, um, the author gets a chance to review the copy edit and approve it um, because it is the author's decision in the end um, to accept the changes or not, unless they are specifically uh, uh, stylistic things that, that have to be adhered to by the journal. Um, then it goes to layout. Um, then there is a proof that's made. It goes back to the author one more time to double check the proof, look at the captions, look at the complete layoff, sign off on it, layout that is. Some journals require every author to sign the proof. Some don't. Some um, just require the lead author to certify that everybody has looked at it. Um, and then finally, it gets published. And at that point, um, the author pays, as I looked for bioscience, $80 per printed page um, to get the article out um, and, into, and into press. Um, in the case of bioscience, it's printed on paper. There's also an online version. It looks very professional. That's because it has professional staff. That's because the, um, uh, the subscriptions are, are pretty expensive. I don't remember exactly what they are, but they're pretty expensive. Um, and you know they really have a staff to lay it out and, and make it look really nice. And at that point, we hope that the article gets read, discussed, and cited. And if it does get cited a lot, it, it improves the impact factor of that journal because what the impact factor is, is the average number of times that the articles in that journal or in that issue are cited, um, whether what you know depending on whatever citation index you want to look at most of them research gate google scholar most of them give you pretty similar metrics on that um, so that kind of in a nutshell would be the process um, at bioscience and um, at a lot of the major journals that you would take from deciding that you want to write an article to getting it all the way through the process and so before I switch to talking about citizen science theory and practice, maybe it's a good chance to see if there's any more questions that have come up or, or anybody, I don't know if you can raise your hand in the chat, um, but I'll take a drink of water while, while that happens. So there, there is a Q and A feature on the, on the, um, webinar platform, but I find that the chat is just as useful. Um, so please do feel free as we're going along, whether it's right this second or not, to interject a question into the chat. There's a little chat bubble icon at the bottom of your screen, um, and I'll do my best to feed those questions over to Rick at a good uh, pausing moment. Okay. so. When we started citizen science theory and practice, oh, I don't know, a, a couple of years ago, it took us probably about a year to get the first uh, issue out, which I don't think was really too bad. Um, we, we modeled it uh, on that bioscience process because I had been part of that for a while and because I felt that it worked really well. Um, but there is a, a huge, a couple of huge differences between citizen science theory and practice and bioscience or a lot of the other uh, larger journals. One is that we were committed to the very, very beginning to be completely open access. We didn't want anybody to ever have to pay anything to be able to um, read any of the articles in the journal. And that's partly because in general, um, the field of publishing is starting to go in that direction. 
but also citizen science itself is supposed to be something that's completely open and transparent. You know, people are contributing to the to different citizen science projects um, and, and even just designing them and, and evaluating them. They really ought to be able to read uh, all of the stuff that's coming out. So we went to a press called Ubiquity Press at the University College London that specializes in open access journals. And the way that open access journals are paid for is by author's fees. So when you publish an article in Citizen Science Theory and Practice, you do pay um, a certain amount uh, for the privilege of getting, of getting that published. Um, Citizen Science Theory and Practice, we charge uh, 500 pounds um, the pound, the dollar's fading against the pound, so that might be close to $600, which could sound like a lot, but it's actually one of the very, very lowest of the journals that, that, that's out there. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit more later on. The other big difference between citizen science theory and practice and some of the other larger journals is that we are completely volunteer run. Nobody gets paid anything at all to put this journal out. Eventually, I think that the editor for the journal is going to need to be paid a small stipend uh, to do this because it's a lot of work. It's hours and hours a week to put this out. Um, but at the moment, nobody receives any money at all. So this is the homepage for citizen science theory and practice. As you can see, um, it's got a little blurb about the journal. And you can see along the right-hand side, the latest articles, the most recent one having come out about uh, analyzing data for volunteers, managers, and scientists just at the end of December. Rick, a quick question here, uh, since we're talking about this journal, uh, Julie is asking if we know, and I'm not sure if we do yet, what the impact factor is for citizen science theory and practice. Hang on to that question. Okay. okay. So if you click on one of the articles, it looks something like this. Um, everything is completely online, completely open to anybody. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool is that each one of the articles um, has its latest metrics um, published. They're updated all the time. So when I made this screenshot yesterday, this new article had been viewed 316 times, downloaded 109, and two people had tweeted about it. Um, Nobody has yet cited it, but it's only been out three weeks, so you'd be pretty surprised if they had. Um, one of the cool things about an online publication like this is that the references are all hot linked, so you can just click on those and go straight to those references. Now, one feature of citizen science theory and practice that most, many people don't immediately find is that if you go up to the top of the page, um, there is something called journal archive, and if you click on that, you can actually see um, the journals in more of a laid out uh, fashion. So we had two volumes in 2016. We had one in 2017. I don't know how many we'll have in 2018. Um, but if you were to click on volume one, issue one, you'd get this and it would look to you much more like a printed journal might look, even though you'd have to print it out for yourself if you wanted to. And again, you can click on any of these articles and read them. The very first one in here um, about strategies for data credibility um, has actually been viewed 7,000 times, downloaded over 1,000. It's had four citations and it's been tweeted about 28 times. So um, the, the journal, Citizen Science Theory and Practice, accepts submissions in different categories, research papers, review and synthesis papers, case studies, and essays. And we're actually have added a fifth category called meeting reports. Um, the first meeting report has been accepted for publication with revisions. Um, it's a report on the first um, meeting of EXA, the European Citizen Science Association, which will be out sometime in the next few months. Um, a meeting report can't just say this happened, this happened, and that happened. It has to really be something that synthesizes what happened and puts it into some new and exciting uh, perspectives. And then we're also adding a sixth category of paper called methods papers. Originally, we weren't accepting papers that were just about methodology and didn't talk about data that were collected or how they were used. But we started getting papers, for example, about how to um, monitor coral reefs. 
in which the researchers had used a lot of um, testing with citizen science audiences and come up with a really good methodology and they were offering it to the field and it seemed a shame that we weren't publishing that kind of thing. So we try to be really responsive to the field and listen for what kinds of papers are desired. So those two, this will be updated very soon to reflect those two new categories. So um, this was another favorite picture that my wife took when we were in Alaska last summer. And I want to point out that while that grizzly bear may not look that big to you, there is no glass between us. Um, we came across her rather suddenly while uh, hiking along a stream and there were actually two cubs. You might be able to see the, the second cub on, over on the right hand side. She did pretty much ignore us, but um, it, it, it's, if you have not encountered a grizzly in the wild at 100 yards, um, I both recommend it and don't. So we'll leave this on the, on the screen here um, while I talk just a little bit more about citizen science theory and practice and then see if there are, are any more questions. Um, the author's fees, we have them just as low as, as we can. We do have to pay the press, and so Ubiquity Press is really not in this business to make money. You can imagine that they are not making money when they get 500 pounds for an article. So last year, that means if we published eight articles, we sent them uh, 4,000 pounds. What, what's that? $5,000. So they worked for us on our behalf and helped us publish those eight papers for a very, very small amount of money, giving us um, the, all kinds of different support. Um, and actually, they don't even charge us quite that much. Um, we have built in a little bit of a, um, an overage so that we can begin to collect a little bit of extra money from the submission of each article that we can put into a scholarship fund because there are simply authors who don't have the money to publish and we don't want to turn them down. If they can get through the peer review process, they have an article that's really important for the field to hear about, we want to see it published. And so we have the scholarship fund to allow small nonprofits, for example, or maybe grad students that don't have a job yet to be able to publish in our journal. Um, I wish that we could lower the cost even further, but I just think we're probably pretty much at a, at a rock bottom um, for that. And um, another thing that I want to mention is that this model of having a paper come in and then having somebody look at it and say, let's get it out for review and finding reviewers. That's not the only way that this can be done. More and more journals are trying new things now. Um, for example, just accepting articles the way they are and getting them online and then having the community, the field, respond to them and criticize them and write about them afterwards. There's actually a name for that, but I can't remember what it is because I haven't studied it very much yet. I have no idea if that's a good idea or a bad idea. Some people might like it, others might not, but we want to experiment going forward with a whole bunch of new ideas in publishing because citizen science is a new and exciting and innovative field and why, why shouldn't we try to do the same thing with our journal? So that, that's something we're gonna be thinking about as we, as we go forward. Now, um, citizen, the, the Ubiquity Press um, is part of the Creative Commons and they're very, very careful about um, adhering to the, what's called the CCBY standards for open access. And they are a signatory to the Budapest Open Access Initiative. Honestly, I never studied any of these things before becoming the editor of the journal. And I have a lot of catch up to do. But I am convinced that by partnering with Ubiquity Press, we are in the forefront um, of working in the field of publishing to make sure that we have the highest of integrity and the most uh, open principles um, for, our, um, for our articles. And there, there's a no lock-in policy. So one of the things that that means is that Ubiquity doesn't own anything at all whatsoever about these articles. And if we said to them, you know what, we're tired of you, we want a new publisher, they would immediately export all of the stuff completely over to our new publishing platform. So um, it's really a, a pretty exciting group of folks to work with. And they're able to do that because they are at the University College London and because they are actively studying and researching new ways of publishing there um, in, in an academic way. Um, and they archive um, in as many places as they are able. And when I say as they are able, um, there are some archives that have specific um, requirements that we haven't met yet. So for example, some of the archives require that you have 
X number of articles coming out every month. And we're still building up to that trajectory. So there's a couple places we haven't gotten into yet. But we're very, very are very well indexed by the, by the services that you can see on this slide. You can go into the journal website. I just did a screenshot right off our site and you can read about the, the archiving policy. Um, whoops, didn't mean to go there. Because there was that question about, um, about impact factor. Well, we don't yet have an impact factor for citizen science theory and practice. It takes a couple of years before the group that issues that, uh, the impact factors begins to do so. And that's because it's based on the number of, um, average number of citations and we are such a new journal that there isn't any number that would be very meaningful yet. Now, I'm told that after two to three years, we will finally get an impact factor. I know it'll be low. Um, they always are. And we'll just try to see if we can get that up there over time. The reason that that's important is because there are folks in the, in the academic field um, whose advancement... Um, you know, uh, annual, annual uh, reviews by their supervisors, tenure reviews and all that sort of thing require publishing in, in journals that have high, um, high impact factors. So it's a catch-22 when you're getting started. I have a lot of colleagues and I would really like them to send some of their papers here instead of some of the other places that they are sending them. Um, they have a lot of reasons for sending them other places. They might think that the other journals are more suited for their particular audience, or they might say, I just can't do it. I can't send it to citizen science theory and practice because it's not yet well enough known. So it's the old chickle, you know, chicken and egg, and eventually I think that we'll, we'll begin to emerge from that and become better known over time. Um, we've published about 24 articles, I think it is, in the first couple of years. So it's about one a month that's coming out. I hope that that will start to go up um, fairly soon. Um, I can tell you, if you've been following, you know that we just issued um, a request for um, articles for a special issue, a theme issue of citizen science theory and practice on ethics. We thought we might get six or eight abstracts and put out a really nice issue with six or eight articles in it. Well, by the deadline, we had 27 abstracts submitted and people were still writing in and saying, I know I missed the deadline, but can you, can you still accept my abstract? And we have a guest edit, two guest editors for that, Lisa Rasmussen and Karen Cooper, and they have reviewed the abstracts very carefully and said, you know what, these are keeper abstracts. We've got 27 really fine looking papers here. So right now we're thinking a couple of things. One, okay, uh, we've got to get some more uh, handling editors on board and some more reviewers on board. But two, maybe this is a, re a really good way to get, um, to get more papers for the journal. Because when people see that there's a call for a specific theme, it may get them um, more motivated to, to contribute to, to the journal in that way. I do think we'll be issuing a request for articles about citizen science and policy within the year 2018 and a couple of other things that we're thinking about as well. So I'm looking at my notes. I uh, think I have said most of the things that I wanted to remember to say. Um, and at this point, I would then open it up for further questions. Great, well, thank you, Rick. And. Um, as I've mentioned before, we're going to be using the chat window here for questions. So please do feel free to go ahead and insert any questions that you might have for Rick there and uh, we'll voice them to him. I'll ask a, a question just to start out here, Rick, if you don't mind answering. I know you've talked about journals and about this journal for citizen science and some of the um, opportunities that that has brought up. And I was wondering if there were any um, unique opportunities in addition to what you've mentioned that citizen science raises for journal publishing or for uh, peer review publishing. Hmm. I'm not sure if I really know what your question is. And if you have a potential answer, seed it to me. Well, while I, while I think about a, a clearer way of, of asking that, I will ask you a question here that's coming from Dana. Um, 
which is just generally, what are, what are the general benefits of publishing? Why publish at all? Huh, that's really a good question. Um, as a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, I had thought that's how I should start this. Um, so thank you for asking that question. There are so many different answers. First, um, citizen science theory and practice has a really large and general readership of academics, practitioners who are not in academia, even some people who just participate in projects, but they're interested in the, in the broader field. Um, a, a journal like Bioscience is primarily published in um, by academics, and so there can be so many different motivations to publish for, for the different folks that might want to send in an article. At the Lab of Ornithology, where I've been for 40 years now, um, your value as an employee um, is largely measured in terms of peer-reviewed publications. Whether that's right or wrong, that's a, that's a different topic, maybe for a different webinar. But that is the currency right now um, for uh, getting promoted from assistant professor to associate professor or associate to full, um, you know, the, the tenure review. Um, you just have to have peer-reviewed cited publications in journals with the highest impact factors possible. So every two years at the board meeting of the Lab of Ornithology, when our board comes to review how we're doing, our director puts up a graph and it shows the trajectory of the number of peer-reviewed journals that have been published um, by the Lab of Ornithology over the year. And as every year it goes up and the board cheers and says, you guys are doing a great job. But more, more generally, um, in a field like citizen science, there's so much to learn from each other and from the other projects. That's one of the reasons that I really want to have as many case studies as possible. Um, and, and also this new category of methods papers. If you have something that's really working or not working, it's really important to get it out there for the, for the field to read. Uh, now, some people might say, well, then why does it have to be a peer-reviewed journal? Um, why can't you just have a, a newsletter or a magazine that people can uh, put stuff in? Why does it have to go through this rigorous process? It's hard to find reviewers. I think an answer to that would be, that in some ways, we're still trying to prove to certain audiences that citizen science is real science, that it's rigorous. And so by maintaining the rigor of peer review and academia, I think we're opening the eyes of a lot of readers that we are serious about what we're doing. We're able to produce results, results um, about the findings, the impacts of citizen science that um, you know, could be published in, in any other academic, academic journal. Um, I think so. I think those are some of the reasons. Um, some of the reasons to publish. There's probably a whole lot more. Um, if, you, if if I haven't really answered your question, go ahead and ask it again. I throw a couple more key words at me, and I'll try again. Dana says thank you. Um, okay. And and I will I will just add to what Rick has said that. Um, one of the things you may not have mentioned, Rick, but is implicit in the name of this journal, Citizen Science Theory and Practice, is that it's a journal focused on how citizen science is done and how we know how it works. That the science that comes out of citizen science, we really want to see that published where appropriate in the disciplinary journals um, that shouldn't be marginalized from other kinds of research outcomes. But one of the things that we're really well aware of across the field of citizen science is that peer reviewed publications aren't the best metric for all projects. Um, so this is a journal to serve some needs um, and shouldn't at all imply that all projects should aspire to publish here. But it's a service that we're trying to provide as a place for sharing knowledge um, across the field about how, how uh, citizen science can be done in different contexts. Um, thank I, you. Thank, thank you for that, Jennifer. That was brilliantly, brilliantly stated as appropriate. Let me just um, say, for example, that whale shark, whale shark article in bioscience, that doesn't belong in citizen science theory and practice. Those are scientific outcomes. There, that article really showed the world how citizen science could be used to track these whales around the globe and it belongs in a very high quality scientific journal. But before we started citizen science theory and practice, there wasn't a journal where you could write about 
um, the theory of designing a project for maximum educational or learning outcomes about knowledge of the nature of science, for example. You could put that into science education maybe, but we didn't really have one clearinghouse for those kinds of, of papers. So that's really, really what we're after. And we actually won't take papers that are focused on scientific outcomes um, because they really do belong in those disciplinary journals. So thanks for bringing that up. So I have another question here uh, from Julie, who's asking, for citizen science theory and practice, do most people who submit manuscripts come from a social sciences background? I don't think there is uh, most people. Um, we have, <clears throat> no, we, we've got scientists coming from scientific backgrounds. Um, they're all across the board. There, there is no typical kind of author for citizen science theory and practice. Um, it's, a, it's a welcome home for people who do come from a social science background, you know, very, very welcome. <clears throat> and it's hard for folks like that to publish in something like bioscience. <clears throat> but it's really across the board. Great. Um, feel free, other folks, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the chat window. There's a little icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, and Rick, I'll ask, a, I haven't come up with a better way of clarifying the question that I asked earlier, which was just a general opportunity to comment on um, uh, new questions that are raised when we try to publish in a field where we're really trying to open up the practice of science itself. So uh, taking a traditional practice of publishing in peer review journals when we're looking at citizen science as um, questioning and expanding some of those traditional practices, are there new opportunities that come up with a journal? Um, but again, I, I am struggling to uh, really put a, put a fine point on that question, and maybe others can ask more pointed questions. I will ask something. I know uh, people have talked about publishing data sets, and I don't know if you can comment on um, where the conversation is around that for citizen science theory and practice with an understanding that there is at times a benefit to getting, uh, an, I believe it's an ISBN number for a data set as a reference um, to point to uh, where people can find the metadata around a single data set. Yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. For citizen science theory and practice, I can tell you that if you go into the journal website and dig into the about this journal um, in there, along with the open uh, the, the archives policies and stuff that I showed a screenshot of, there is something in there about publishing data and what Ubiquity's policy is. And I'm sure that if we were requested to do it, we would, we can, and we would. But it isn't something that we've actively talked about, sought out, for example. Um, it is possible to publish supplementary information in citizen science theory and practice, just like it is in most other journals. So some of the articles, for example, if their findings are based on a survey of, of learning outcomes, and that survey was developed by the authors, um, a lot of times that will be in there essentially as an appendix. Those are not peer reviewed. Those are not even copy edited. They are just put in there the way that the author sends them in. That would be the case in, I think, pretty much any journal. So that's an opportunity to get more stuff out there where people can find it. And another opportunity to bring transparency to the research process as well when everything is made available through, the, through links in the article. Um, another question here, which maybe you can shed some light on from your position as an editor with talking uh, and connecting with a lot of people across the field. Um, this isn't specifically about publishing, but I think you may be in a position to uh, see some of the insights from, from your role. What are the leading schools or departments in the U.S. that focus on interdisciplinary research, particularly offering MS or Ph.D. programs relating to citizen science? You mean the specific schools? 
I think I think there's uh, uh, an interest here in hearing some names of a few specific schools. Yes. You know what, and Jennifer, you're going to be able to answer that question better than I can, um, and you're welcome to answer that question. Um, I don't really know. Yeah, and my perspective on that would be uh, that there are very few schools that are focusing um, specific programs on citizen science and many, many more who have faculty with a deep interest in citizen science. Two that come to mind that are speaking directly to citizen science throughout programs that they offer, um, and we can talk about others that have, there are many that have rich faculty resources. Um, one is the uh, public engage, uh, the public science program, which is at uh, North Carolina State University. There's also a citizen science and community science program um, offered through the School of Education at UC Davis. But again, these are just two and there are many, many others. Um, and I would invite uh, anyone who's interested in looking for specific faculty to uh, just send me a, a query at info at citizenscience.org um, and I would be glad to put you in touch um, with a little bit more information about what you're looking for whether it's citizen science for as related to learning or citizen science as related to a particular area of interdisciplinary research. I will tell you, I, I will share one little insight here that has come from receiving a large number of articles is that almost all the ones that we get uh, at Citizen Science Theory and Practice have the same first two pages. Citizen Science is this, it's defined as that, there are these different kinds, um, it has these different kinds of science outcomes, and the, the first two pages are, are interchangeable. Um, and so a lot of times when we're writing back and asking for revisions, we're saying to the authors, you know, this is a, this is, we know that your paper has to stand on its own. You may show it to your mother or your grandmother, and they really do need to understand what citizen science is before, it can, you know, going on to the rest of the paper. But it is going into a journal about citizen science, so you don't have to completely explain everything there is to, to frame the field. Um, a funny thing about that is a lot of you know that Karen Cooper was one of the founders of the journal and she was uh, worked with me on editing the first um, issue. And, and I know Karen really well. She worked with us here at the lab for a while and she had written a few of those letters herself um, back to back to authors about really needing to cut back that framing. And then she submitted an article to the journal, which was just very recently published. And I wrote to her and I said, Karen, here are the reviews. And guess what? You really need to cut back on those first two pages. And she said, but, 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 <laughs> now that I'm on the other side. But still, as a general rule, if you're thinking about submitting something to the journal, we really need to have the, the framing and the literature cited about your topic. So if you're writing about motivation and reasons to participate in citizen science, that's what the introduction needs to focus on and what the literature review needs to be about with just a paragraph saying citizen science is this, that, and the, and the other thing. Yeah, I will just add to that, Rick, though, and say that um, one of the wonderful things about this field is that citizen science is many things. And one of the things that this journal allows us to do is to learn from the different perspectives that we bring to the way citizen science is done in different places. Um, and so it can be helpful to say a little bit about the context in which citizen science is done, um, where, the, where that work is taking place. Um, but I do know that there were lots of conversations about how the value of this journal was to be able to save a lot of authors those first three or four paragraphs that it takes when publishing in other places where people don't have any idea what citizen science is exactly. or even um, how to start understanding um, how to offer a constructive review of a citizen science paper. So this gives a, a much a much more nuanced perspective on what citizen science is, which is nice. It allows us to think about um, 
productive similarities and meaningful differences and be able to learn together about our different practices. So at this point, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, if I've missed any or if some occur to you after the fact, please don't hesitate to send an email. I've put uh, the contact information there into the chat, but again, it is info at citizenscience.org. Um, and I'll take a first stab at answering if I can or send it along to Rick or others if I can't. And uh, really glad to have all of you who joined us today and those of you who may listen in later on the recording to have been part of this conversation. Um, and we'll look forward to pushing out information both about the journal and about forthcoming webinars and welcome your thoughts on both. Again, feel free to use that contact email, info at citizenscience.org to share ideas um, moving forward. Rick, any last closing thoughts? Uh, I think I am uh, talked out here. I hope that that was helpful. I hope that it was resembling something along the lines of what you were hoping for, Jennifer, and all the rest of you who, who joined in um, or who may listen later. I do, I do love working with the journal. I think it's a really exciting contribution from the Citizen Science Association to the field. And I'm really glad that I'm being allowed to have this role as editing it. Well, thank you, Rick. And again, thank you to everyone who's joined in. And we'll look forward to hearing from you in future sessions. Have a great day.